Okay, so I'm going to talk about graphing tools for scheduler tracing. Um, so basically, I mean, I think probably everyone knows here, the scheduler is very important for your application performance. The scheduler is deep inside the operating system, so we have to figure out what it's doing. Um, so fortunately, we have trace command that collects all the information about what it's doing. And then we have kernel shark that can show us everything about what it's doing. Um, so I was quite interested in very large machines, at least at the time, kernel shark was not scaling terribly well to um, showing me all 128 cores at the same time. And so I decided to develop some other tools and it kind of spiraled out in from there. Um, so I'm going to talk about that here. Um, so basically my goals were to be able to see all activities on all the cores at once. Um, so to kind of get an overview um, I also wanted to have make files that I could share with other people, so I wanted PDFs. Um, and so a big weakness of my tools as compared to Kernel Shark is there's no interactivity. You have to run it on the command line and give options saying how much you want to see at a particular time. You can't zoom in dynamically. Um, that's definitely a weakness. So I'm going to talk about two or illustrate two tools in this talk. We have some other tools that are also available. So the tools I'm going to talk about are called dat to graph and running waiting. So dat to graph just shows you when your tasks are running on which cores. And running waiting shows you how many tasks are running at a particular time and how many tasks are waiting at a particular time. Uh, so two other tools that I've made that are publicly available are called stepper. Stepper shows you what instruction, what event is happening and what's happening on all the cores, what PID is running, what PIDs are waiting and so on. Um, and also, we were also interested in virtualization. So I made another tool, um, host guest, which shows you what is running on each VM and what the host thinks each vCPU is doing. Uh, so these are all publicly available and I've made a bunch of other tools and we'll kind of see that along the way um, that are kind of of less general interest. Um, so the, I'm going to present these tools for using an example. So the example is from the NAS benchmark suite. So these are kind of uh, kernels of scientific applications. Uh, the application I'm going to talk about is UA. It does something. It doesn't really matter what it does for this talk. But the important thing is that it has N threads running on N cores. And so from a scheduling point of view, this should be completely really completely uninteresting. I mean, your threads start, they should just run, and then they should just finish. Nothing should happen at all. Um, so we can get to know our benchmark a little bit. This is not my tools. This is just running. We plot the run times. Uh, so I ran it in two different situations, or three different situations. One of them is where I uh, pin the threads on the cores in kind of a perfect order. I've got a four socket machine. All of the examples are for this four socket machine. It has 128 hardware threads. Um, and I just pin them in a round robin way, which makes them come out in a nice way um, with respect to the behavior of the application. So those are the, and uh, that was one approach. Another approach is just to pin adjacent threads to a single socket. And those are the first two numbers. We get about, I don't know, 17 seconds. And if we just pin the threads in a completely random way, then we get about 20 seconds. So we learned two things. Pinning gives pretty stable behavior. And the other thing we learn is that this application is somehow memory sensitive because if we pin things in a random way, then it slows down a bit. Um, so, but I was interested in, so what happens if we forget about pinning and just let the Linux kernel scheduler do the right thing? Um, so actually I've given this talk several times before. Each time I take different versions of Linux. Now I've taken the most recent version of Linux, uh, Linux 6.5 versus 6.6. .6. Uh, so there was a big change in between, which is EVDF. Um, and so you can see that something very unfortunate happened in the terms of the performance. I mean, already we have something unfortunate that happens. If you look at these blue things for 6.5, we start out at about 20 seconds like we had with pinning at least random pinning, but over here on the right-hand side, so, so I've just taken, done 50 runs and I've sorted them from fastest to slowest. So it's not a coincidence that they come out this way. Um, but you can see by the time we get to the slowest run, it's twice as slow, actually. This is about 40 seconds over here. It's about 20 seconds over here, so it's twice as slow. 
Um, but now if we're doing 6.6 .6 with EVDF, now we're up to about 85 seconds as the worst case. Um, and you can see the performance is already starting to degrade in a noticeable way, even about halfway through my 20, 50 runs. So I was interested to figure out what is going on here. Um, so this is the first tool called dat to graph So it takes a trace file. It looks at all of the SCED switches. It sees when you start running and see when you stop running. And it makes a little edge in between them. So in the x-axis, we have the time. In the y-axis, we have the cores. And so you can see what's happening on each core. The colors are the PIDs. Uh, there's only actually six colors, but it's good enough generally to see that things are switching. Um, so I don't know how well you can see this. Um, basically, you can see that the things run along for a while and then they switch around for a while. Um, we can kind of focus on some parts of here where more exciting things seem to be happening. And you can see that we have some little gaps. Um, and things bounce around for a while around these little gaps. And then things kind of go back to the normal situation and we just move along again. So this is what happens on 6.5. Uh, what happens on 6.6 .6 is this. Um, so these graphs, they look the same width, but you should notice that, of course, these are this one goes up to about 35 seconds. This one's going up to about 83 seconds. So the scale is quite different. Um, we have kind of the same behavior in the sense that there are some places where things seem to be running along in a stable way and some other cases where things seem to be going badly. Um, but there's a really important case where things are going really badly here, um, which is that we have these big white spaces here. Um, so it's like we're, we're not used, basically we're not using our machine in a proper way because we, one of the cores is not doing anything which inevitably means that some other cores are doing too much because we have n threads on n cores. And so you can see the problem, if you just look at this blue box I made, the problem seems to resolve itself in some places, but that's actually an illusion because you can just scoot up here a little bit and see that there's more gaps. Um, so actually between about 15 seconds and about 70 seconds, um, the things are going badly in terms of the performance. Um, so basically, we have these gaps. Gaps are fine when you have nothing to do, uh, and gaps are not a good thing when you have something to do. So we can ask ourselves in this situation, do we have something to do or not? So then we come to the other tool that I'm going to show, which is running waiting. So we just want to see how many threads are running and how many threads could be running. How many, like, what is the total set of threads on the machine? So the running ones are the green line, and the waiting ones are the space between the red line and the green line. So we just have a little, this is only 6.6 .6 I'm showing. We just have a little space between the red line and the green line. You might think a little is not so bad. Here we have a little space, a little tiny space, but it's just like one, one thread worth of space, but it goes on for a huge amount of time. And so that's just like killing us in terms of performance. Um, so we can see this in a little more, uh, the running waiting has another option, which is this one where you can see what's happening on each socket. This is a four socket machine. Two of our sockets are doing pretty well. We have the green line all the way up there at 128. And two of our sockets are doing badly. We have one of them that has a red line, which is over, sorry, it's not 128 here. Here it would be um, 32. Here we have a red line, which is over. So this socket is the overloaded one, and here we have another socket, which is the green line is under 32, and so that's the one that somehow ought to be stealing that thread back from this socket here, but for some reason that's not happening. Um, so, uh, so we, I mean, we can sort of put this together. We have problems on different sockets. We have. Uh, we observed previously that we had some kind of memory issue, and so we can ask ourselves, is this a NUMA balancing problem? Um, so now we can look at NUMA balancing. So that to graph, it has another option, which is events. And so then we get the same horizontal lines where all the threads are running, uh, but we also get some information about some of the other scheduling events. And now you can study up here on the slide on the right-hand side, we have a green, some green lines that go 
from indicate NUMA balancing, they connect the source of the, the place where the thread was before to the place where the thread ends up. It also tells you how many occurrences of NUMA balancing there are. So there's around almost 600. Um, and you can see there's some kind of regions here where a lot of threads are moving around. So there seems to be a certain amount of NUMA balancing that's going on. There's some other periods where nothing much happens with benchmark. This is 6.5. Uh, we do have NUMA balancing and we do get good perform or pretty good performance. So that's an observation. We can move on to 6.6. Um, here's 6.6. Um, so you might think this maybe, I don't know, it looks a bit strange maybe, but you can look at this NUMA balancing. We still have lots, a certain amount of NUMA balancing. And we can look at the numbers over here. It says 459 times of NUMA balancing. Before, we had almost 600 times of NUMA balancing. So it doesn't seem that an excessive, in terms of absolute numbers, it doesn't seem like an excessive amount of NUMA balancing is happening. Um, so maybe NUMA balancing in itself is not really the problem. Uh, we do have these yellow things. This is like uh, load balancing that's on the same socket. The threads are somehow trying to reorganize themselves. We have also lots of IPIs here on this socket. I have no, I haven't looked into. Maybe that's something I should be looking into, but I haven't checked on that yet. Um, so then I thought to myself, so what's new with EVDF? So one thing with EVDF is that the time slice length changes. Um, so here I have made another tool that I just like, I mean, it's not one of my commonly used tools. It's just a tool that I made on the fly because I wanted to know about this time slice question. Um, so I just take basically the same information as data graph. When do we start and when do we stop? But I, I record the amount of time that's taken and then I sort the times according to um, how, you know, from the shortest to the longest and so on. Um, I also stopped to cut it off at 17 milliseconds because more than four ticks, I don't really, that's not really what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in kind of like, what is the minimal time slices that things are getting? So we have, um, I divided it up also if we yield or if we sleep. Uh, sleeping is not very interesting because like the task can just sleep whenever they want. So there's no real control over um, how long they run before they sleep. Um, but yielding is something that's controlled by the scheduler. If you look at 6.5, you see actually we have different plateaus here. Um, this is one tick, two ticks, three ticks, four ticks, and then other things that run for a long time. And if you look at EVDF, then we just have one tick all the time. Um, so this is perhaps different. Um, I, whatever, I don't know why. Um, this particular graph, it's counts, and so it's not like there's more of them. It, it works out somehow. Uh, it's not the amount of time taken by ticks at this length. It's just the count of these ticks. So obviously, if we have ticks, so if we have time slices of only one tick, we're going to have more of them than if we have time slices of four ticks. That's probably not the main issue. Um, so then we have, we can observe, um, do we care? that they are all of size one, or do we care that they are all of the same size? So those are two options. I mean, we can observe this, but those are two conclusions we could think about from that. Um, so what I did is I took 6.5 and I made, there's a, in 6.5 there's a function which is called sked slice, and I made it either just return one, that's kind of to simulate EVDF without changing anything else. And I made it to do something very extreme. I made it return eight, um, which is bigger than what CFS would have done. And you can see that actually um, in this graph here with these running times, the green one is the time slice of one. And the green one coincidentally ends up in exactly the same place as EVDF, but it does not actually rise in the same way. The green one rises a bit lower than EVDF rises. And if we have a time slice of eight, then it rises even faster and ends up even higher. Um, so I'm sure you're all wondering what the problem is and what the solution is and so on. Um, but this is where my story ends. Um, I actually don't know what this, I, I don't know what's going on. 
um, if somebody knows what's going on, I would be very happy to hear about that. Um, that's not really what this talk is supposed to be about, though. This talk is supposed to be about the tools and not um, EVDF. Um, so first, I'd like to know if anyone knows what's wrong, what's going wrong with uh, this application, this case. Um, but in more, more general, from a discussion point of view, what I would like to know is, like, when you see these kinds of performance degradations, what do you do in terms of tracing and what do you do in terms of visualizing the output? What would you like to be able to do? And so on. So, comments, questions? Okay. <laughs> what? Yeah, I, I think what, what one? Yeah. Th thank you for putting me on a bad situation, Stephen. <laughs> oh yeah, but we care. We care about the other scheduler. No, I, I, I found I find nice the way that you organize the data, and it make easy to to understand how the CPU time was used. It's not easy to do this with pure tracing mm -hmm. and we don't have like a standard standard way to visualize this as data mm -hmm. because if, if you have a standard or if we can like continue use this, this format uh, over the time people get used to it and they would just have a glance and say boom boom whoa this look data mm -hmm. i think that it's very interesting because just looking at tracing it, it takes time too much time On point, if we had something like this while, for example, EVDF was developed, it was like easier to uh, find, yes, spot issues, uh, seeing if uh, we kind of find a way to standardize this type of plotting and uh, mm -hmm. data gathering might help uh, developing. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, maybe a uh, thing to try is trying to use the new parameter, the runtime, that you can can try to make different timelines by splitting the execution time in these different slices to see if you can find one that reproduces the same problem. But that's that's ongoing on the boogins. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really have much experience with tracing. I'm just mm -hmm. here to learn. But mm -hmm. one piece of information that I think might be interesting is if we could actually see the hardware topology in more detail, not just NUMA nodes, but like the the core siblings and their last level cache associations. Mm -hmm. And maybe that would help us see maybe some correlations because the, the thread numbers may not necessarily match that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, in this case, I do, there's two points. One of them is the data graph has an option which reorganizes the thread numbers according to the sockets. And so that's what I was showing. But it's true, there's no division between the first socket and the second socket and so on. Um, but I, as the user, know this information. Um, so I think other users, when they work on their own machines, they would also know this information. But maybe there's a way to make it more apparent. It could be useful. Yeah, one uh, thing I also want to mention is I am working on a tool called Lib, um, LibiVal, or sorry, LibTracyVal, which um, basically kind of makes it easy to read the trace.dat file. Or it's not actually dependent on trace.dat file. Um, I just use it with the trace that file because you can pass it in any type of event. So all you can do is basically a way of saying, okay, here's the start of event, here's the end of event, mm -hmm. and then keep track of the timestamp and the delta and give me the max, min, average, standard deviation. It does it all for you. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things. It's basically a tool to basically scan a bunch of like millions of events mm -hmm. and then be able to come up and give you a histogram mm -hmm. at the very end. So it's mm -hmm. dealing with histograms, but I mean, this is something that maybe we should look at. I don't know if you, I think, did I tell you about that? before I think I might mention it I don't know perhaps yes yeah but something that maybe mm -hmm. look at to help feed it into another graphical tool I mean I mm -hmm. I, I I'm the original author of uh, Colonel Shark but I handed my maintainership off to uh, Jordan Karjoff who rewrote it in Qt and I'm not a very good Qt developer so it's and he uses C++ to the extreme so um, I used C++ in 1998 and it's changed tremendously since then so I have trouble modifying that code. But anyway, uh, if anyone else would be interested in helping extend Kernel Shark, it's still an open source project. Jordan still maintain it if you want to help there. But uh, we, anyone else have any comments or discussions? Uh, on the scheduler problem, like I think it's worth looking. There was a problem reported by, I think it was Ben Segal with the way PIC -E VDF was being done. And it was related to the slice as well. There was a bug recently fixed. I don't know if it was has gone to 6.6 .6 or not. 
but there were some bug reports in that area that's mm -hmm. worth trying on mainline and see if you see the problem. Okay. So I'm, I think my conje my conjecture is that it does all this uh, NUMA balancing and then it's it needs to somehow override it afterwards because it does too much and somehow in 6.5 it was able to override it and in 6.6 .6, somehow it's failing to override it. That looks like a bug, to be honest. Right. It might be related to that one. Yeah, but it's... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, are these all running local, like local traces and then local visualization? Yes. Okay. And is there any interest in like making that more of a like collaborative, up on a web view sort of thing? I haven't considered. Maybe we could talk okay. about more what you mean afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.